Khanna is proud to present Tech Vistara, a series of guest lectures aimed to unravel the world around us. It is my pleasure to welcome Professor Anand Narayanan, our honorable guest speaker. He has been a TEDx speaker and a distinguished astrophysicist. Sir, you hardly need any introduction. You have made us all inspired by your distinguished research in the field of astrophysics. Without wasting much of your time, I welcome him and request him to present his screen so that we can learn and dive into the world of science. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Nidham. Uh, thanks for the brief, uh, kind introduction. Uh, thanks to uh, all the organizers of Tech Vistara for uh, extending this invitation for me to come and talk to you all today. Nikita, Gaurav, Ikshita, Swapnil, and all the organizers of this fest. So um, we have a lot of ground to cover, and I've been told that I should leave a, a enough time for question and answer towards the end. So without uh, delaying this any further, let me jump into the presentation. Okay, so maybe uh, one of you can tell me whether the slide is visible in full. I just started sharing the screen. Yes, sir. So the screen, uh, screen is visible to us. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for the confirmation. So um, what I'm going to be talking about today for the next 45 to 50 minutes or so is one of the greatest adventures that has been unfolding in the field of astrophysics in the last 25 to 30 years or so, which is the discovery of planets orbiting around other stars. So these planets, uh, which are orbiting other stars, they are collectively referred to as extrasolar planets or exoplanets. And the first discovery of a planet beyond the confines of the solar system, outside the solar system, orbiting another star, that discovery happened in the year 1995. And ever since then, uh, there has been a tremendous progress in this field. And uh, the developments that have been happening in this field, the discoveries that have been made, they have been uh, creating a lot of buzz, not, not only in this, within the scientific community, but also in the popular imagination. And uh, rightly so, because uh, the discovery of planets elsewhere in the universe uh, addresses this larger, more profound question of the possibility of finding life elsewhere in the universe. So one of the age-old questions that the human mind has been toiling with is, are we alone in this universe? Uh, or could there be another planetary environment somewhere else within our galaxy or beyond our galaxy where conditions might be favorable for life to exist? So uh, this is a question that has been uh, occupying human mind for centuries. And uh, uh, the discovery of extrasolar planets or exoplanets is the first crucial step towards addressing this question in a scientific way. And that is one of the main reasons why this field has been receiving a lot of traction in the popular uh, press, popular media also. So uh, in today's presentation, I'll be talking about how astronomers detect extrasolar planets. Uh, as it turns out, uh, it's not very easy to find planets orbiting other, around other stars. There are some great barriers. There are some challenges in uh, finding these planets. So what are the techniques that are used? What are the techniques that are employed to find planets? And uh, what does, where the field currently stands? And what are the things that uh, uh, lies ahead in the future? Okay, what are the promises that this field is offering for the near future? So... One of the first things that we learn in school when we study about outer space is are the planets of our own solar system. So if you look at our solar system, there's a nice uh, arrangement of planets. We have the inner planets, which are made of rocky material, non-volatile material, hard material, material with a very high melting point. And further away, you have the large gaseous planet. So there seems to be a nice organization of planets within the solar system. And all our theories about how planets form around stars, how they organize themselves, for a good part of the history of astronomy, it was based on this one example of our own solar system. 
prior to 1995, we did not have direct observational evidence for the existence of planetary systems beyond the solar system. But uh, for a long time, astronomers have been speculating that there should be planets around other stars. If you look at the night sky, there are untold number of stars in the sky. In our own galaxy, there are about 200 billion stars and sun is just one star. And uh, when we look at the night sky, all the stars that we see in the night sky, they all belong to our own galaxy, the Milky Way. And so there are innumerable number of stars and there is no reason why only sun should have a uh, planetary system around it. Only sun should have objects going around it. So uh, for a long time, astronomers have been hypothesizing or speculating about the possibility of planets being present around other stars. But uh, there were some difficulties, as I mentioned in the beginning, there were some challenges in discovering these extrasolar planets. So I'll uh, begin this presentation by talking about those difficulties, those barriers or challenges in finding extrasolar planets. Okay. So is solar system the only planetary system? If it is not, then how do we go about finding these extrasolar planets? What observational techniques can be employed to find these extrasolar planets? So one of the biggest challenge in finding planets around other stars is the contrast in size between stars and planets. Okay, So I'm sure many of you have seen this. This is an image that was widely circulated in social media. This image is to scale and it shows the sun and the planets of the solar system to scale. So this uh, image is just to remind ourselves that planets are incredibly small when compared to stars. For example, if you take the biggest planet of the solar system, Jupiter, Jupiter is still 10 times uh, smaller in size when compared to the sun. Earth is 100 times smaller in size compared to the sun. So there's a huge contrast in size between a star and a planet. Now, uh, this is a picture that many of you may have seen. This is an image uh, uh, taken by the Cassini spacecraft back in 2013. Cassini was a spacecraft that was sent to study the outer planets of the solar system, particularly Saturn. So in this picture taken by Cassini, this is Saturn. The light from Saturn is blocked out, but you can see the beautiful rings of Saturn. But down below, you see a pixel that is glowing. That is Earth reflecting sunlight. Okay. So we have not even left the solar system. We are very much within the solar system. From the distance of Saturn, Earth looks like a dot, like a point source. The stars that we see in the night sky, they are hundreds and thousands and tens of thousands of light years away from us. At those incredibly large distances, even a star would appear as a point source okay, to even the biggest telescopes. Now, planets, since they are much smaller compared to stars, obviously they are going to be smaller than a point. So we are trying to, die. if you want to directly see an extrasolar planet, we are talking about imaging something that is very, very small. Okay. So that, that is point number one. The, uh, the second uh, difficulty or the added difficulty to this is the contrast in brightness between a star and a planet. So what is shown here are synthetic spectra of the sun and planets of the solar system. So we are going to use this as an example to talk about how bright a star is compared to planets that are revolving around that star. Okay, so we are going to use our own solar system as an example. So on the vertical axis, you can think of it as brightness and on the horizontal axis is wavelength in units of micrometers, micron. So one micron, uh, and higher would correspond to infrared and uh, one micron and lower would correspond to the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum. Okay, so now if you look at it, this, this black line, if you can see my mouse pointer, this black is the spectrum, the synthetic spectrum of Jupiter, so simulated spectrum. The blue is Earth spectrum, uh, then there is Mars, etc. So uh, the moral of the story here is, the reason why I'm showing this is, if you look at the visible part of the electromagnetic spectrum, so wavelengths less than one micrometer, the contrast in brightness between a star and a planet is a billion to one. Okay, And if you look at infrared, the contrast is slightly better, but it's still a million to one. So what that means is, if you take a picture of uh, a star that we see in the night sky, for every billion photons that you get from the star, you are going to get one photon from a planet that is orbiting that star okay, in a given interval of time. 
If you do this imaging in infrared, uh, you'll be getting a million photons from the star and one photon from the planet in some interval of time. So that's the contrast in brightness. So star is a point source, planet is smaller than a point, the star is a billion times to a million times brighter than the planet. Okay, that uh, th these are the two factors. And add to that one more thing, which is that the angular separation in the plane of the sky between a star and a planet is will be very very small. Just to give you an example, if you take our solar system, okay, you take Sun and Jupiter, which is at a distance of approximately five astronomical units from Sun. And if you take this uh, Sun-Jupiter system and keep it at a distance of roughly 30 light years, so that's about 10 parsec, if you know what a parsec is. So a parsec is about three light years. So if you keep it at a distance of 10 parsec, the angular separation in the plane of the sky between Sun and Jupiter seen from a distance of 10 light years will be less than an arc second. So that means the angular separation is less than 1 by 3600 of a degree. So you have the star, which is a point source, with a planet, which is smaller than a point, with a brightness contrast of a million to one, separated in the plane of the sky by an arc second. Okay. So when you take a picture of the night sky, for sure we will see the star, but it will be really difficult to see the planetary companion it uh, to give you an analogy you know you imagine a thousand watt floodlight in the stadium floodlight okay which is bright and right next to that imagine that there's a tiny led that is glowing okay so the led if you look at it you will easily miss the led the led will be lost in the glare of the star or a glare of the thousand watt um, floodlight so the similar scenario is what you encounter when you take when you try to take pictures of extrasolar planets. Okay, so direct imaging of extrasolar planets is not a trivial task. It's not easy. So does that mean that there is no hope? Okay, as it turns out, there are some really nice indirect ways of finding extrasolar planets, exoplanets. And uh, the two most, there are about a half a dozen techniques, indirect ways of finding extrasolar planets, but the two most successful techniques have been radial velocity method and transit method. Both these methods are called indirect methods for finding extrasolar planets because in both these methods, we don't directly see the planet. Our observation is confined to the star. Based on measuring a behavior of the star or some properties of the star, we will come to the conclusion, we will come to the, we will make the inference that the star has a planet around it. So for that reason, this, these are called indirect ways. So you indirectly you establish the presence of a planet by doing observations of the star. So your observation is confined to the star. Okay. So since radial velocity method and transit methods are uh, both we have been very extremely successful in the discovery of extrasolar planets, I'll be spending most of my time talking about these two techniques. I'll be spending a larger chunk of time talking about radial velocity method and a smaller a fraction of time talking about transit method. Okay, So that's what the plan for the rest of the talk is. So let me start off with this radial velocity method. See, generally, uh, very loosely, we talk, when we talk about stars and planets, we generally say that planets are revolving around stars. Okay, so that's okay as far as, you know, what we learn in school is concerned. But we know that both stars and planets, you know, they are, uh, the star planets are not uh, in reality revolving around the star. The star planet system has a center of mass, which is sometimes referred to as Barry Center in the case of our solar system. So the star planet system has a center of mass and uh, the star planet system being a dynamically stable system, uh, the, uh, the both the star and the planet are not revolving around each other, but they are revolving around the common center of mass of the star planet system. So you imagine a hypothetical star as it is shown in this animation here and with a planetary companion to it. Now, if the planet is sufficiently massive, and if it is uh, close to the star, then the center of mass of the star planet system can be outside the star. If the planet is very small 
in size and mass and if it's far away from the star then the center of mass will be inside the star itself which is what the case is with, with most of the planets and sun within our own solar system but in this particular animation that is shown here we are assuming that the planet is sufficiently massive compared to the star and it's close by so that the center of mass is outside the star now as the planet revolves around the center of mass in bigger circles you can see that the star is not stationary but it is also going around in smaller circles so if uh, if a star has a companion to it then the star will undergo this kind of an oscillatory motion around the common center of mass of the star with the companion this oscillatory motion is called wobble motion or sometimes it's called wobbling and sometimes it's called reflex motion and it is this reflex motion that we measure in radial velocity method to come to the conclusion that there is a companion to that star and we can measure a lot of properties of that companion even if we do not see it, the companion directly okay so that i'll explain how it is done okay so these are the terms that are used uh, wobble motion wobbling reflex motion for the basically the back and forth motion of the star with respect to the bary center or the center of mass of the star planet system so how is this measurement done well when we look at the sky okay since the stars are at enormously large distances from us we are not going to see the star physically moving easily okay there are some rare cases where we can actually see the star physically moving around in small circles in very very rare circumstances but in most cases because the distances are so large we don't we won't see the star per se moving around in the plane of the sky so how do we then therefore detect this wobble motion or this reflex motion so the way this is done is by recording the spectrum of the star so the there is a telescope the purpose of the telescope is to collect light and focus it that's the only purpose of a telescope telescopes telescopes are like huge light buckets they collect light and then they fo uh, focus it so at the back end of the telescope there will be a spectrograph the spectrograph will have a dispersing element either a gray some kind of a grating the uh, the light that uh, passes through this grating or gets reflected off the grating it will be uh, dispersed it will be wavelength dispersed it will be spread into its component colors or component wavelengths okay so that is what is shown here imagine that this is a hypothetical star okay this is just an animation which i'll be playing in a minute this is a hypothetical star with a planetary companion around it now remember that in radial velocity method we do not see the planet our observation is confined to the star but for the sake of illustration here the planet is also shown and let's assume that this is the uh, visible wavelength spectrum of the star okay so watch what happens to the spectrum as the star undergoes this wobble motion so if you look at the spectrum you can see that there are some dark lines okay since most of you are physics students i do not need to tell you that those are absorption lines produced by atoms and ions on the surface of the star on what is known as the photosphere of the star so there can be atoms of hydrogen there can be sodium potassium uh, calcium and all these other elements also sometimes in their ionic form so all these elements um uh they will absorb some of the photon they will selectively absorb some of the photons for example if there are hydrogen atoms then hydrogen atoms will absorb balmer alpha photons they will absorb balmer beta photons if there are sodium atoms then there will be sodium d1 and d2 absorption lines which are the sodium fraunhofer d lines so uh, there will be absorption lines produced by chemical elements on the surface of the star these absorption lines if the star is at uh, rest with respect to us so meaning that if there is no relative motion between us 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 the observers and that distant star then these lines will be occurring at where they are expected to occur okay. but if the star is exhibiting some kind of a relative motion with respect to us suppose the star is moving away from us then we will find that the spectrum will be red shifted and if the star is moving towards us we'll find that the spectrum will be blue shifted so if the star is perpetually moving away from us if we keep on measuring the spectrum of uh, the star we will find that as a function of time the star is exhibiting a systematic red shift if the star is perpetually moving towards us 
then as a function of time if we measure uh, the spectrum if we keep on recording the spectrum on successive nights week after week month after month we will find that the spectrum is exhibiting a blue shift but instead if the star is undergoing this wobble motion then what we will see is that the there will be a periodic blue shift red shift blue shift red shift in a cyclical manner okay which will tell us that the star is neither forever moving away from us nor is it forever coming towards us instead from wherever it is located it's undergoing this kind of a circular motion sorry it's undergoing this kind of a circular motion so the wobble motion is really measured by looking at the uh, periodic blue shift and red shift in the uh, spectral lines or in the spectrum of that star now you can uh, already very well imagine that if the wobble motion is large for example if the center of mass is really far away from the star uh, because the companion is a massive planet then the wobble motion the amplitude of the wobble motion will be larger and so will be the shift in spectral lines the spectral lines will shift by a large amount towards the blue and the red part of the uh, spectrum if the uh, wobble motion is tiny then the shift in spectral lines will also be a very very small amount so how do you con convert the the shift in wavelength to velocity so this is the expression that uh, links that so lambda rest is the wavelength of a given absorption line in the laboratory frame okay in the rest frame so for example if you are looking at balmer alpha lambda rest will be 6563 angstrom if you are looking at balmer beta line from hydrogen it will be at 4860 angstrom whatever we measure in the laboratory lambda observed is what we observe that line to be in the spectrum so if there is no relative motion if there is no radial motion between us and that star lambda observed will be equal to lambda rest radial component of the velocity will be zero if lambda observed is greater than lambda rest that is what we will call as a red shift and vr is a positive quantity by definition and if uh, the star is exhibiting a blue shift then the observed wavelength will be smaller than the rest wavelength and vr will be negative so by uh, by observing the shift in wavelength we will be able to convert it into a relative radial velocity between the star and us now before we proceed further it will be a good idea to look at what are the typical values of this radial velocity uh, when you have a star planet system so let's take the example of sun and jupiter so let's say that you have a star that has a mass similar to the mass of sun and you have a planet that has a mass similar to the mass of jupiter which is the massive most massive planet in the solar system and let's say that this planet is at a distance of 5 astronomical units from the sun from the star okay so the same distance between sun and jupiter that is the case then the reflex velocity of sun due to jupiter is of the order of 13 meter per second okay. so what that means is if you want to measure a jupiter like planet orbiting around a sun like star in the that we see in the night sky and let's say that the star is at a distance of 1000 light years from us then we should be able to measure the wobble motion of that star to a, a wide accuracy that's better than 13 meter per second if you want to measure this 13 meter per second wobble if you think about a earth sun like system then the kind of uh, velocities that we are talking about is of the order of few tens of centimeters per second so what this means is even this radial velocity is not a trivial measurement you need to have extremely good instruments to be able to do this excellent um, spectral resolution very high spectral resolution extremely stable spectrographs with very stable observing conditions so the entire uh, in uh, game is called high precision radial velocity measurements which uh, radial velocity measurements done with at at very high spectral resolution spectral resolutions of 100000 or more with excellent wavelength calibration you should be able to measure the wavelengths of these lines to very high amount of accuracy and uh, just to give you an idea okay if you are talking about a meter per second kind of wobble motion the amount by which the spectral line would shift on the detector plane so the detector is usually a ccd uh, array 
and uh, uh, there will be pixels on the CCD. It's a two-dimensional surface with pix picture elements on it, pixels on it. The uh, if you have a Jupiter-like planet orbiting around a sun-like star, because of the gravitational pull of that planet, the wobble motion of that star, in order to detect it, the kind of shift that will be happening to the spectral lines will be one or two pixels from where the wavelength is supposed to be. Okay, so unless the spectrograph is very stable, we will not be able to make these measurements, which means which means that you need state-of-the-art kind of instrumentation. So I'll just show you behind the scenes of the kind of uh, instrumentation, kind of optical engineering design that goes into this kind of a high precision radial velocity measurements. So here is a uh, telescope dome. Okay, um, this uh, this particular telescope is the 3.6 meter telescope in the Atacama Desert in Chile. The telescope is owned and operated by the European Southern Observatory ESO. Um, this is in a place called Paranal in Chile, uh, South America. And the reason why I'm showing this is because this particular telescope has been used for detecting exos exoplanets using radial velocity method. So this is the outside dome structure. If you go inside, you can see the telescope here. Okay, so it's a huge mechanical structure. So there's a lot of mechanical engineering that goes into the construction of telescopes and the uh, auxiliary structures to it. So if you are a mechanical engineering uh, student, then uh, you can play an active role in the, in the instrumentation aspects of astrophysics. So this is the telescope and this particular telescope has a spectrograph called HARPS, which is high accuracy radial velocity planet searcher. And the HARPS instrument is shown here. Okay, and you can see that the entire spectrograph is um, enclosed inside a cylindrical uh, chamber. And this is actually a vacuum chamber. Once the chamber is uh, shut, then use with the help of a vacuum pump, air is sucked out of it. And the, all the optical elements of the spectrograph is inside this cylindrical chamber, which is of the size of a fridge. Okay, And um, the reason why it is enclosed in a cylindrical chamber and air is sucked out of it, etc., is because if you if the spectrograph is open then air passing through the turbulence of the air can screw up the wavelength calibration or screw up the uh, the, the accuracy of our measurement so you need absolutely still conditions for uh, to be able to do this kind of high accuracy radial velocity measurements so if you break open this uh, 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 the cylinder you can see uh, all the optical elements that go into uh, the construction of a spectrograph like this. Okay, there are there are there will be gratings, there will be collimators, uh, there will be optical fibers to bring light from the telescope to the spectrograph. The spectrograph is actually kept in a separate room, and the spectrograph is fed with the light from the telescope with the help of optical fibers. Okay, so all these uh, so there's a lot of interesting optical engineering design that goes into uh, the construction of telescopes and backend instruments. I just wanted to give you a feel of. Uh, the kind of sophisticated engineering that goes behind the scene. So now coming back to the technique of radial velocity method. Okay. Um, yeah, so I'll just quickly go through the theory. Okay, just uh, follow tightly. So what I have drawn here is the orbit of the of a star around which there is a planet. I have not drawn the planet here. And uh, that is because, as you know by now, radial velocity method is an indirect way of finding planets. So we don't see the planet, our observation is confined to the star. So this plus sign here represents the center of mass of the star planet system. And one, two, three, four, they represent four positions of the star. So the star is going around in tiny circles around the center of mass of the star planet system. And these are the four positions of the star. And the velocity vectors, which are always tangential to those points, those are also labeled. Now we are looking at it. Okay, we are not the observers. Okay, we are. The, this diagram is drawn with a top view. The observer is looking at it from this direction, where this arrow mark is indicated, line of sight. So uh, how this will translate into the observer's perspective is the plane of the orbit of the star is along our line of sight. So from Earth, when we look at the sky, no matter which direction we look, we are always looking perpendicular to the plane of the sky. In this particular case, the orbit is such that it is at 90 degrees with respect to the plane of the sky. So it's along our line of sight or orthogonal to the plane of the sky. 
So now if you look at this picture here, at positions 2 and 4, the entire velocity vector is, tan, uh, is uh, perpendicular to our line of sight, which means that there is no radial component of velocity. Our entire velocity component is tangential to our line of sight, so we will not measure any shift in spectral lines. Whereas positions 1 and 3, the velocity vectors are either pointed directly towards us or pointed directly away from us. In those cases, we will see the maximum shift in spectral lines. So now you imagine the star going around in the circle. As the star goes around in the circle, the shift in spectral lines is going to move from zero shift to a maximum shift and then back again to zero shift and then again maximum shift in the opposite direction. So blue shift, red shift, so on and so forth. In other words, the radial component of velocity that we measure will be a sinusoidal wave. Okay, that's how the radial velocity will change. If V star is the velocity of that star, assuming uniform circular motion where V star is a constant, then uh, what we measure, which is the radial component, will be V star into cos theta, which is also the same as sine theta. There is only a phase shift of pi by 2. So the observational signal will be like a sinusoidally varying radial velocity measurement. So now let's add some more uh, factors to it. So here in this picture, I'm showing the star and the planet. So the blue circle represents the planet's orbit around the center of Mars and the red circle represents the star's orbit around the center of Mars. So by definition, the star and the planet have to be always on opposite sides of the center of Mars. That's the whole idea of center of Mars. If it's not like that, then it will not be a dynamically stable system. So let's say that A star is the orbital radius of the star with respect to the center of mass and AP is the orbital radius of the planet with respect to the center of mass. Remember that we don't see the planet only for the sake of derivation we are drawing this. The star is moving around with a velocity V star for the for a, for a, to make our life easy just assume this to be a circular orbit so it's a uniform circular motion. So VR is equal to V star cos theta that's our observational signal. Now we can also write VR as 2 pi A star by P cos theta. So velocity is distance by time, which is the circumference of that circle divided by the time period it takes for the star to complete one orbit around the center of mass. So notice that P is the orbital time period, but I have not written a subscript star here. And the reason is because the orbital period of the star will be the same as the orbital period of the planet. By the time the star completes one orbit around the center of mass, the planet would also have completed one orbit around the center of mass. Otherwise, they will not be on opposite sides of the center of mass. Okay, so the orbital periods for the star and the planet are the same. So Vr is equal to 2 pi a star p cos theta. So if you are now measuring the shift in spectral line as a function of time, so for example, tonight you go and observe a star, you record its spectrum, tomorrow again you record its spectrum, day after tomorrow again you record its spectrum. So you're basically measuring this uh, radial velocity as a function of time. You'll find that the radial velocity varies like a sinusoidal waveform, okay, where time is along the horizontal axis and radial velocity is along the vertical axis. The semi-amplitude of this radial velocity curve will be equal to 2 pi a star by p, and one full phase, one crest and trough of this waveform will correspond to the orbital time period of the star around the center of mass, which is the same as the orbital time period of the planet. So here is your first information about the exoplanet. We have not seen the exoplanet, but by carefully monitoring the radial velocity and finding out how it changes with time, we can already determine what is the orbital time period of the planet, even though we have not seen it. Now, since we know P and since we know the semi-amplitude, we can find out what is A star. Okay, Semi-amplitude is equal to 2 pi A star by P. P we already know, so A star can be found out. But A star is not of much interest to us because we are interested in the exoplanet. We are not interested in finding how far away the star is from the center of mass. So for that, we, add, we proceed along this uh, calculation. So let's say that M star is the mass of the star and MP is the mass of the planet. So this is Kepler's third law, p square is equal to 4 pi square by gm star a cube. 
what is a here well a is the combined separation between the star and the planet at any given instant of time what's the separation between the star and the planet so that sir, is yeah sir but the stars also move around the center of galaxy then how do we keep account of that yeah that's a good question so there is a lot of other movement that is uh, overlaid on top of it okay so uh, perhaps you can ask this question towards the end of the presentation and then i'll try to clarify it in some detail okay so the, there is the motion of the star with respect to the center of the galaxy and uh, there is also the fact that we are on a revolving platform so earth is going around the sun sun is going around the center of the galaxy so is the star so one has to subtract out all these velocities to be able to determine the star's absolute velocity with respect to its center of mass so all this heliocentric corrections have to be applied okay that's the short answer to your question so let me uh, move ahead uh, we, we can discuss this uh, during the q and a so uh, a is a star plus ap you may remember this for, from the conversion of a two body problem to one body problem so p is an observable from the radial velocity curve sorry from the radial velocity curve we can already determine what p is mass of the star as it turns out m star okay is a quantity that we can estimate massive stars tend to have a certain kind of spectrum intermediate mass stars tend to have a different kind of spectrum low mass stars tend to have a completely different kind of spectrum so the spectrum of a star can be used to estimate can provide us a handle on what is the mass of the star so the very spectrum that we record to measure the radial velocity of the star can be used to also estimate its mass so m star is is a quantity that can be estimated p is a direct observable which means we can determine what a is once we determine what a is a star we already know from the previous slide if you remember a star we already know so we can find out what is ap okay which is how far away the planet is from the center of mass or you can find out a itself from this kepler's third law and that will tell you how far away the planet is from the star is the planet very close by is the planet very far away that information can be known so we now know the period we now know the orbital separation of the planet from the star the last thing that we can determine is the mass of the planet okay so for that we just write this m star a star is equal to mp ap and mass of the planet is a star by ap m star m star we know a star we we have determined ap also we have determined so we determine the mass of the companion so in short what i am trying to say is that in a nutshell the this entire idea of radial velocity method is you measure the wobble motion you look at the spectral lines from there you try to infer the properties of the unseen companion which is making the star wobble okay now of course the real world scenario is not as simple as writing m star a star is equal to mp ap etc for example there are many layers of complexity that one can imagine so just as an example Uh, the picture that i showed you earlier corresponds to this scenario where the orbital plane of the star and the planet is along our line of sight in other words with respect to the plane of the sky if this vertical line is the plane of the sky then our line of sight is always perpendicular to the plane of the sky the orbital plane is along the along our line of sight which means the angle of inclination with respect to the plane of the sky is 90 but the angle of inclination need not be 90 what if the orbital plane is in the plane of the sky if that is the case then we will never measure a radial will uh, motion for the star in other words we will never see a wobble motion so if you have a planetary system where the planet and the star's orbital planes are in the plane of the sky in other words if the or orbital planes are perpendicular to our line of sight then we will never measure wobble motion we cannot detect exoplanet systems that are in the plane of the sky through radial velocity method now it can be at some arbitrary angle okay in that case the equations get modified a little bit you will have a sin i term coming into this i'm not going into the details of it but i'm just telling you that there is a sin i factor that comes in and usually just by looking at an exoplanetary system uh, if it is exhibiting wobble motion we will not be able to tell what is the value of i we will not be able to tell whether i is 90 or whether is i is less than 90 all we can say is if the star is exhibiting wobble motion we can say that i is not zero 
the star planet system is not orbiting in the plane of the sky that we that much we can say but we cannot say whether the angle is 1 degree 5 degree 10 degree or is it 70 80 we don't know so the inclination remains a uh, unknown quantity in the radial velocity method okay, i'm just going to skip this slide so the actual expression for radial velocity is not 2 pi a star by p into cos theta but it looks something like this 2 pi a star into sin i where i is the inclination angle of the orbital plane with respect to the plane of the sky e is the eccentricity of the orbit and theta is a, the phase of the orbit which is a proxy for time and omega is another constant you don't have to really worry about it it's another constant term so this is the final expression and one can derive this easily uh, uh, using basic orbital mechanics okay so in other words vr is some semi amplitude k star times cos theta plus omega e cos omega okay so this is that k star factor so this is the equation that we have for a uh, radial velocity method or radial velocity of a star when it has a companion so using this expression uh, we can figure out using this expression and using data we can figure out all these parameters of the exoplanet we can figure out what is p we can figure out what is eccentricity e of the stars orbit around the center of mass which will be the same as the eccentricity of the planet's orbit we will be also able to figure out what is the mass of the planet okay so just to give you an idea of how eccentricity plays in here so far what we looked at, so far what we looked at was circular orbits if it is eccentric orbit as shown here here red is the star and green is the planet so if uh, let's assume that the orbits are not circular if they are eccentric then what happens is instead of a sinusoidal curve you will have a sawtooth kind of waveform this is not exactly a sawtooth but you'll have a like a distorted or squished sinusoidal waveform and uh, the reason why this is so is very very evident okay if you have a eccentric orbit then what is different is that the angular velocity and the linear velocities are not constant so when the star is very close to the center of mass it will be moving faster and when the star is far away from the center of mass it will be moving slower okay so this is kepler's second law the, the star has to sweep out equal areas in equal intervals of time so the orbital velocity is not a constant and that gets reflected in the radial velocity also there will be times when the radial velocity will be changing slowly and there will be times when the radial velocity will be changing very fast so from a sinusoidal we begin to see kind of a sawtooth waveform so any if the radial velocity is changing in a sawtooth waveform or, or like in a sawtooth manner or or like a, not like a sinusoidal then that is immediately suggests that the orbit is not circular there is an eccentricity to that orbit so i'll just show you how the uh, radial velocity curve changes with eccentricity so this is e of 0 and we are radial velocity along the vertical axis and time along the horizontal axis and you can see that it's a nice sinusoidal curve as the eccentricity varies the radial velocity signal also changes it becomes like this so the the way the radial velocity changes as a function of time can be used to constrain the uh, the shape of the orbit okay what kind of a conic section it is whether it's a circle or whether it is whatever it is so the the way so the how astronomers do this entire business is they measure the they record the spectrum of a star as a function of time so they repeatedly take the spectrum of a star and if they uh, if they find that the star is exhibiting a wobble motion they will invest more and more telescope time on that star and they will measure radial velocity as a function of time so here each data point corresponds to a radial velocity measurement of a particular star as a function of time so let's say one of the stars in the night sky you are continuously monitoring its spectrum and you find that the star is exhibiting this wobble motion you convert that wobble motion into radial velocity this is what you get now this is like looks like a scatter plot now what you this is your data now what you do is you go back to that expression for vr and you try to model it such that you can uh just a second let me just, yeah so so you try to model this data uh you try to fit this data with the model by tweaking the free parameters that's what you do 
So you have this mass of the planet like this, and P is orbital time period, K star is the semi amplitude, M star is the mass of the star, E is the eccentricity. So M star you can estimate from the star spectrum. All other things you treat it as free parameters, and you keep uh, uh, changing them until you get a best fit to the data. And once you get a best fit, you have determined the orbital time period and other properties of the exoplanet system. So this is how. Uh, in 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 real world, this entire measurement is done. So just to summarize this, the properties of exoplanets that we can learn from radial velocity method are one is we can uh, measure the mass of the planet. Second is we can measure the orbital time period. How long does it take for the planet to go around the star? We can also find out how far away the planet is from the star. And lastly, we can find out what is the eccentricity of the orbit. So all these properties, all these crucial properties of the exoplanet, we can determine even without seeing that planet by measuring the wobble motion of the star. Okay. So using this radial velocity method, back in 1995, two Swiss astronomers, Didier Culos and Michel Mayor. Uh, so Didier Culos is on the left and Michel Mayor is on the right. They uh, they were doing an observational campaign to measure the uh, spectrum of uh, thousands of stars. One of those stars in their sample was a star called 51 Pegasi. Okay, 51 Pegasi is a star that lies in the direction of the constellation Pegasus. I think the distance is about 50 light years or so. So 51 Pegasi was one of the stars and they did not know whether there are any planets around it. Okay, in fact, no exoplanets were known before that. So, uh, they were randomly monitoring the radial velocities of large number of stars. 51 Pegasi was one of it. And they found that 51 Pegasi exhibits a, a wobble motion. And by measuring this wobble motion over a period of one and one approximately one year, they were able to determine the properties of the unseen companion. So this is the paper that they published in the scientific journal Nature back in 1995. The title of the paper says a Jupiter mass companion to, to a solar type star. Okay, so the, the abstract says the presence of a Jupiter mass companion to the star 51 Pegasi is inferred from observations of periodic variation in the star's radial velocity. What is really interesting is the next line. The planet, which is of the size of, or of the mass of Jupiter, it lies about 8 million kilometers from the star, which would place this planet inside the orbit of Mercury in our solar system. So then they say that this planet could not have formed at that location because you cannot form such a big planet so close to a star. Therefore, the hypothesis is that the planet probably formed further away from the star and it has been migrating. In other words, the planet is in an unstable orbit and so it is slowly, the orbit is decaying, spiraling in, the planet is spiraling in and they have detected it when it's very close to the star. Okay. So for this discovery of the first extrasolar planet around a star, um, star like the sun. Uh, in 2019, uh, Michel Mayor and Didier Kilos were awarded one half of the Nobel Prize in Physics. So about 25 years later. So this is the radial velocity data that was published in their paper. And you can see here that the horizontal axis is kind of normalized time and the vertical axis is the radial velocity. Each black data point corresponds to the measurement of a spectrum of that star. And the stick, stick-like thing that is sticking out from each data point is the uncertainty, is the error bar in it. Okay. So here is more. Here are the, that was the first detection. Uh, soon after that, there were many more exoplanet detections using radial velocity method. Here is another example. 16 Cygni B uh, is an exoplanet that was discovered around the star 16 Cygni. The planet has a mass of about twice the mass of Jupiter. And uh, it's, it orbits around the star with an orbital time period of about 800 days. So if you are uh, if you are a long period, if you are detecting a long period planet or to detect a long period planet, you need to observe the system for many years. So what that means is that in a short order of time scale, most of the discoveries that you are going to make using radial velocity method are going to be discoveries of exoplanets that are orbiting very close to their host star because orbital time periods are going to be smaller. Okay. I can come back to these plots later on if you have questions. I'll just skip some of this. Okay, so now 
the technique is extremely efficient and uh, uh, there have been thousands of extrasolar planets that have been discovered using radio velocity method but the technique also has a bias one of the biases of a radio velocity method is it is biased towards finding big planets orbiting close to their stars so if you are a small if you are if you want to detect an earth like planet orbiting around a star uh, at a sufficiently large distance from the star then the radio velocity amplitude is going to be of the order of centimeters per second and if the uncertainties in your wavelength uh, shift is larger than that then you are not going to detect it so the radio velocity technique is biased towards finding massive planets orbiting very close to their stars so these kind of things are called hot jupiters big planets orbiting very close to their star the collective name for them is hot jupiter okay I'll just skip couple of these slides because i have been asked to wind up quickly yeah so we're coming quickly to the next method transit method so transit method is also an indirect way of finding exoplanets uh, here again we don't see the planet directly our observation is confined to the star in radial velocity method we were measuring the wobble motion okay we were constantly monitoring the spectrum of that star in transit method what astronomers do is they constantly monitor the brightness of a star so uh, suppose let's say that this is a star and we are constantly monitoring the brightness of that star now while we are monitoring the brightness of a star if a planet happens to pass in front of it then for that brief duration of transit the planet will block a little bit of light from the star and this will cause the brightness of the star to dim or to dip by a small amount by a tiny fraction once the planet moves out of the field of view then the brightness of the star will again come back to its normal value and the next time this will happen is when the planet would complete one orbit around the star and will again come in front of okay so suppose uh, if you take the case of uh, earth sun system uh the two transits will be uh, differing in time by about 365 days so something like that okay so the planet blocking the star's light causing the light from the star to dip is the observational signal that is used to confirm the presence of a planetary companion around that star now um you obviously you know one dip is not adequate you recurrent reoccurring dips in brightness of the star at regular intervals of time is what you need to confirm the detection of the planet now if you have a, a planetary system where there is a small planet and a big planet both revolving around the star so multi planetary systems something which we did not cover yet so if you have multiple planets around the star then uh, uh, if you have a smaller planet and a bigger planet then obviously the bigger planet is going to block a larger fraction of the light from the star which producing a larger dip in the brightness whereas the smaller planet is going to produce a smaller dip in the brightness of the star so in other words the depth of the dip in brightness will be a measure of how big or how small the planet is so in radial velocity we could estimate the mass of the planet in transit method we can determine the size or the radius of the planet okay so during uh, when there is no transit happening the flux that we will get from a star will be proportional to the cross sectional area of the star that we are facing so pi r square is the r square is the radius of the star pi r square is the amount of it will be proportional to pi r square which is the cross sectional area of the star so that the amount of light that we get will be proportional to that when the transit even happens the planet will be blocking the light from the star for a small fraction of time so during this transit event the uh, light that we get will get diminished by this factor of pi r p square okay so then the decrement in flux is uh, on transit uh, off transit minus on transit and the fractional decrement in the light flux means the amount of light that we are getting per unit time is proportional to or is equal to rp by r star the whole square so if you can measure by how much the light is dipping we can estimate what the size of the planet is if we know the size of the star 
Now, as it turns out, the mass of a star and the size of a star are strongly correlated. The more massive a star is, the, uh, the bigger it will be, and the smaller the star is, the less massive it will be. So, the if we can determine the mass of a star, we can estimate what the size is going to be. So, the size of a star is a quantity that can be estimated. Delta F by F is a quantity that we can measure by monitoring the light from the star and seeing by how much it dips. From that, we can measure what is RP, the size of the planet. Okay. So, this is how the signal will look like. On the vertical axis is the brightness from a star and on the horizontal axis is the time of observation. So you are repeatedly measuring the brightness of a star. You are continuously monitoring the brightness of a star. And uh, the brightness has been normalized to its normal value. So that's why this is one here. And each blue dot that you see is the measurement of brightness of a particular star. So you can, you can see that the brightness dips again it comes back to normal again it dips again it comes back to normal again it dips okay so the the depth of this dip will be proportional to r will be equal to rp by r star the whole square once you know r star you can determine what rp is the radius of the planet even though you have not seen the planet and the at least three dips are required to confirm the that the planet exists. So you need some kind of a redundancy to be able, before you make an announcement that you have discovered a planet. And the time period between two successive dips is going to give you the orbital time period. Okay, how long does it take for the planet to go once around the star? And from the orbital time period, we can determine how far away the planet is using Kepler's third law. So here is the actual data, HD 209458 is a star and around that star, the first extrasolar planet using transit method was discovered four years after the detection of the first extrasolar planet using radial velocity. So in 1999, using transit method, the first planet was discovered. Here, what is important is, I would like you to focus on the vertical axis so the values are 100, 99.5, 99, and 98.5. And this says percentage of starlight received. So what this means is when the planet is transiting in front of a star, the star's brightness is not going to dramatically change. It's going to change by uh, a um, magnitude of about 1 to 2 percentage. That's all. So which means again you require very fine measurements to be able to discover these exoplanets or using transit method. I'm just going to skip this part. Okay. I think I'm running short of time. So the last uh, thing, uh, do I have a couple of minutes more or should I just stop here? Maybe one of the organizers can tell me. Yes, sir. you can go for a couple more minutes. Yeah, so I'll just quickly wind up, okay? Not more than five minutes. So both transit method and radial velocity method have been indirect ways of establishing the presence of exoplanets around stars. Uh, they are very efficient. They have yielded the discovery detections of thousands of extrasolar planets, but still, you know, you have not seen the planet. Okay, so the, the holy grail or the the ultimate. Uh, a detection would be where we can actually see the extrasolar planet, whether we where we actually detect photons from the extrasolar planet. Now, in the beginning of the presentation, I told you that it's not easy to directly image extrasolar planets for a number of reasons, but with the advent of technology, particularly adaptive optics technology, which is a very very interesting uh, way of correcting for wavefront distortions in real time. With the invention of adaptive optics technology, it has been possible to do high contrast imaging. And in the recent past, in the last 10 to 15 years or so, uh, about close to hundreds of 100 extra extrasolar planets have been directly imaged. In other words, we have directly seen extrasolar planets. Here is one classical example. HR 8799 is the name of a star, and that star is in the central region. So the light from the star has been subtracted out uh, using a coronagraph and also using some image processing techniques. So if you take out the light from the star, you will see that there are four fainter companions near that star, marked B, C, D, and E. 
Each of them is a planet that is orbiting around that star. So what you are looking at here is a dire, is a true astronomical image, and uh, you are looking at photons coming from those exoplanets. Okay, so you are actually seeing those exoplanets here, as opposed to indirectly confirming their presence. Now, how do we know that these are planets orbiting the star and not just some background distant stars? Well, again, you need to observe the system for a very, very long period of time. So astronomers have been monitoring this HR8799 system for a very long period of time. And what you are going to see next is an animation that is only five seconds long, but it uh, contains data over seven years. So for seven years, if you continuously, astronomers continuously monitored this HR8799 system, they kept on taking images. And they found that these four planets, they found these four planets revolving around the star. So here is uh, what I'm going to show you here is actual data, actual image. It's not just an animation or computer visualization. This black patch in the center, that is the star, and the light from the star has been taken out, has been subtracted out. These are the four planets, B, C, D, and E. And in the bottom, you see the date. 31st July 2009 and when I play the animation you will find that the date changes and you will also find that the relative positions of these planets with respect to the star is also changing. So that's all the animation is only three seconds long but it is seven years of data from uh, 2009 to 2016. So if you are an uh, alien astronomer uh, living in some other part of our own galaxy. And if you were to look at our own solar system, probably you will see the outer planets of the solar system, like Neptune, Uranus, and Saturn, revolving around the sun like this, as faint dots. Okay. I'll show you one more example. Beta Pictoris is a star, and around it, an extrasolar planet has been discovered through direct imaging. So again, this black patch is the star. The light from the star has been subtracted out and there is the planet and uh, in this series of images that you can see which have been stitched together using motion interpolation you can see that the planet is moving relative to the star now you are actually seeing 3d orbit in projection against the 2d sky so if the planet is not going and plunging into the star the planet is going behind the star that's all that's happening okay so it's not colliding with the star or anything so in similar way, uh, about 100 extrasolar planets have been detected through direct imaging. So as a summary slide, here is uh, uh, what I want to leave you with. So uh, this is a cumulative histogram, and it shows the number of exoplanets that have been discovered as a function of year of discovery. Okay, so it's a cumulative histogram means uh, each year, the number of planets discovered, it gets added to the next year. And then that gets added to the next year and so on and so forth. The color coding represents the techniques that have been used for exoplanet detection. The red marks radial velocity and the green marks transit method and the blue is direct imaging. There are other techniques like gravitational microlensing, astrometry, etc., which I have not covered. So as you can see, prior to 1995, we don't know about the presence of exoplanets. After 1995, the first extrasolar planet was discovered, and since then, there has been an exponential increase in the number of planets that we know. As of date, as of 2021, we know of the presence of more than 4,500 extrasolar planets orbiting various stars within our own galaxy. And more than half of these exoplanets have been discovered using transit method. Okay. So transit method has discovered more than 2,500 extrasolar planets and radial velocity has discovered a large fraction of the remaining and few hundreds have been discovered through direct imaging. And uh, skipping through all these slides and uh, there are a lot of space-based missions which are coming up, which are dedicated towards the discovery, towards finding extrasolar planets, planets revolving around other stars. Kepler, I'm sure many of you have heard of it. Kepler Space Telescope was a mission that was launched in 2008 and officially it was decommissioned in 2018. Kepler Space Telescope used the transit method to discover a large fraction of the planets that we currently know. Okay, Close to more than 2,000 extrasolar planets were discovered by Kepler Space Telescope. 
Now, TESS is a follow-up mission, uh, which is already up there in space. Uh, the data the, the data is just coming in, and the announcement of discoveries will happen in the near future. Both Kepler and TESS uh, have detected many, or the Kepler has for sure detected many Earth-like planets, Earth-mass planets orbiting around sun-like stars. TESS is going to improve that number. It's going to enhance that number by an order of magnitude at least. And then we also have the James Webb Space Telescope, which is going to go up into space this year, December 23rd or so is the launch date. There are a couple of other missions also. So what I want to say is that the future definitely looks very promising in terms of the number of discoveries that are going to happen in this field of exoplanet studies. So uh, as a final takeaway slide, what I want to mention is that Prior to 1995, the only planetary system that we knew of was our own solar system. And all the grand ideas that we had about how planets form around stars, how they organize themselves around stars, was based on this one planetary system, which is our solar system. In a short span of 25 years, the discovery of exoplanets has completely revolutionized the field of planetary science. Okay? Now we know of more than 4,500 extrasolar planets. And our current understanding is that almost every star has one or more planets revolving around them. It's just a matter of finding it. It's not easy to find these exoplanets, but it's not impossible either. There are many techniques that can be used to find extrasolar planets. So the next time when you look up into the night sky and when you see these twinkling stars scattered over the sky, you can imagine in your head that every single one of those stars have multiple planets going around it. In fact, planet formation seems to be a natural outcome of star formation. Whenever stars form, planets also seem to form around it. So what that means is there are probably more planets in our galaxy than there are stars. Okay, So that uh, fact, that finding has really enhanced the odds of finding an Earth-like planet where conditions are conducive, where conditions are favorable for life to exist. Okay? And the other factor is that um, astronomers have surveyed only a very, very teeny tiny fraction of our own galaxy. All the 4,000 plus extrasolar planets have been discovered by looking at a set of stars which is not very far from our solar system. Okay? So if you assume that this to be our galaxy, Let's say that hypothetically our galaxy looks like this, then this is the center of the galaxy and we are about two thirds the distance from the center. Okay, This, is this red dot represents our solar system and all the 4000 plus extrasolar planets have been discovered by looking at stars within the solar neighborhood, Okay, within about few tens of thousands of light years of the solar system. Most of the galaxy is yet to be surveyed. So you can very well imagine what it means to this question of finding an Earth-like planet, finding a habitable planet elsewhere in the universe. As of now, we do not know whether uh, life is a rare phenomenon confined to Earth or whether there could be other planetary worlds with liquid water and dense atmosphere where life could exist, life could spontaneously arise and evolve. Okay, so that question remains unanswered. In other words, are we alone in this universe is a question that remains unanswered. But the discovery of extrasolar planets is an important step towards addressing that. So I'll just leave you with this wonderful quote from the science fiction writer Arthur C. Clarke, who said that there are two possibilities. Either we are alone in this universe, so there is either a cosmic loneliness to our existence, or we are not alone in this universe. Both are equally exciting possibilities. Okay, so with that, I will end the presentation. I'll be happy to answer questions. Thank you, sir, for such an interesting session. I would request the participants to ask questions one after the other, preferably by raising their hand so that we can come to know who is ready to ask a question. Thank you. Sir, there are two questions already in the chat box, so it would be much better if we could start off by answering them. Yeah, so let me see how. Yeah, so um, Swapnil, are you there? 
Uh, hello. Yeah, I see Mohit and others raising hands. So, I mean, it's up to you. I mean, if you guys organizers, if you want to streamline yes. the question. Yes, sir. We will go through the questions in the chat box first. So the first question is, sir, often news like an Earth like planet has been found surfaces. How are we how are we able to confirm these characteristics if we cannot even see it? Plus there is interference of its star too. So OK, so what do we mean by Earth like? OK, so I'll explain that. So the, the definition of Earth like does not mean that it is a planet that is hosting or that is harboring life. We cannot know that uh, right away. So what uh, in the field of exoplanet studies, what they are referring to when they say Earth-like is a planet with a mass and a size comparable to that of the Earth at uh, a distance that is neither too close to the host star, nor too far away. So if you are too close to the host star, then even if you are a rocky planet, you are, the conditions are going to be like what, Mer what the conditions are on Mercury or Venus. If you are too far away, then the temperatures will be very, very low. And uh, again, conditions may not be favorable for life. So when they say Earth-like planet found, what they are referring to is a planet with a mass and size comparable to that of the Earth, uh, neither too close nor too far away from the host star. So with that information, you are just speculating that if the planet, well, the planet seems to be of the right size and at the right distance from the star. So if all other factors are uh, present, then it uh, there could be, the conditions could be favorable for life. That's all they mean. Okay. So, so when they say Earth-like, they don't mean that there is liquid water there or there is the presence of life there. Those things cannot be known readily. And I don't understand what you mean by interference from starlight. So as the starlight is going to definitely affect our measurements if you are talking about direct imaging. But uh, there are ways to get rid of that. Okay? There is a way to block the light from the star so that you see what is around the star. It's called coronagraph. And uh, uh, in the case of radial velocity and transit method, uh, these kind of interferences from the stars are not a major concern because you are observing anyway the star. So, yeah. That will be the short answer to the question. Yeah, thank you for that question, sir. I think uh, Mohit raised uh, his hand. Mohit Kumarja, you can proceed with your question. Excuse, uh, am I audible, sir? Yes, you are Mohit. Uh, yeah. So uh, my question would be, sir, uh, what would be the limitation of these uh, methods with respect to the distance? I mean, how far? Away, can we like uh, use this distance to uh, like uh, measure the uh, detectance of exoplanet or something? Uh, because uh, yeah. as the distance uh, increases, the uncertainty will also increase, and at some point, we won't be able to tell if there is a planet or not. Yeah, yeah, good question, Mohit. So let's uh, take the both these techniques. Like radial velocity involves recording the spectrum. Okay. So in order to record a spectrum of reasonably good signal to noise, we should be getting sufficient amount of light within reasonable exposure times. So um, telescope time is very precious. You cannot invest, uh, you, nobody has access to infinite amount of telescope time. So within the given amount of observing time that uh, one has, one should be able to detect uh, or, or one should be able to record a spectrum of reasonably good signal to noise. For that, you should get a lot of photons from the star. Now, if the star is at a very large distance from us, then obviously it's going to be faint. Even if the star is intrinsically bright, because of its large distance, it's going to be faint. And therefore, the spectra may not be of adequate signal to noise to be able to measure tiny shifts in spectral lines. So very far away stars, their spectroscopy may not yield high signal to noise spectra for measuring wobble motion. In the case of transit method also, you need uh, some amount of light to get within some exposure time to be able to measure the brightness of the star, to be able to monitor the brightness of the star. So in both cases, the stars cannot be too far away. So if you are sitting on one edge of the galaxy, if you try to observe stars at the other edge of the galaxy, then it's not going to work with radial velocity or transit method. So both have these limitations. Direct imaging involves detecting photons from the planet itself. 
So the planet itself is intrinsically faint. So again, you cannot detect uh, through direct imaging exoplanetary systems that are very far away. Now, having said that, if you have been following news lately, uh, very recently, a couple, two, three weeks back, there has been an announcement of a tentative detection of an extrasolar planet outside of our own galaxy in a galaxy called M51, okay, which is called the Whirlpool Galaxy. Uh, astronomers have detected tentatively claimed that they have detected an exoplanet. This is using transit method and the, you can go and read about it. Okay, it deserves a 15 minute of lecture by itself. The exoplanet has been discovered using transit method around a set of binary stars, which are X-ray binaries. So they emit X-ray photons and uh, they have uh, astronomers monitored the X-ray brightness of these binary system using the Chandra X-ray observatory and they found that the X-ray brightness dims or uh, it, it, it completely shuts off for a tiny fraction of time. So they, they have claimed that this is because the binary system has planets going around it. Now this, uh, this discovery made it big in the newspapers and in public media, etc. because it is the first detection of an extrasolar planet beyond our galaxy. But if you read the paper, uh, the authors are very clear that it's a very, very tentative detection. They are just putting forward the presence of a planet as one of the likely possibilities for the dimming of the brightness. So in terms of how far away we can detect, if this turns out to be true, then this is the farthest that we have found in so planetary systems. But otherwise, in normal circumstances, it's easy to find brighter stars which are closer by. Monitor brighter stars that are closer by. Srijan so has raised his hand. Uh, uh, yes, sir. sir. So like uh, in the middle of lecture, uh, like you discussed about some machines were involved in which mechanical engineers were involved extensively. So, sir, like like I wanted to ask for this in particular regarding to India, like for ISRO, like do they outsource the machines or like the ISRO engineers only design it or like. Yeah, so uh, ISRO, um, Indian Space Research Organization, does not have an extensive wing that does research in astrophysics. Okay, So ISRO is uh, primarily a space technology organization, which is, um, uh, if you look at the, the, the major activities of ISRO, it involves launching satellites, Earth observation satellites, communication satellites, remote sensing satellites, etc. This is the bread and butter of ISRO. This is the major activity of ISRO, and that's what the country needs. So Indian Space Research Organization is not directly involved in the construction of telescopes. Having said that, there are a number of institutions, there are a number of astrophysics institutions across the country, uh, Indian Institute of Astrophysics, uh, Indian Institute of Science, uh, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, IUCA, NCR, etc., which are involved in the construction, design and construction of telescopes. In some cases, the engineering part of designing, constructing the telescope and the backend instruments are outsourced. In some cases, from scratch, right from the construction of the telescope to the building of the uh, uh, backend instruments is done by instrumentation groups, gr uh, research groups that are dedicated for developing instrumentation in these research institute itself. But even in those cases, there is going to be a lot of overlap with industry. There's a lot of going to be a lot of R&D that is done in collaboration with industry partners. So uh, whereas in some cases, the construction of the telescope itself is outsourced, like you buy the telescope from somewhere else. So it's happening both ways. But um, what I want to mention is that uh, all these discoveries have been possible whether it is using ground-based facilities or whether it is using space-based observatories, all these discoveries have been possible because there have been engineers who have been working with scientists. Uh, when I say engineers, I don't just mean mechanical engineers, electronics and communication engineers, optical design engineers. All these people are working together to realize uh, a common goal, which is to build a world-class observatory. So there's a, there's a lot of technology, science, symbiotic relationship that goes into the design and construction of telescopes. So if you are an engineer, uh, you can definitely play an important role in the development of instrumentation and also in the research in astrophysics. Yeah, so thank you, yeah. sir. Yeah.
Yeah, so Mohit, you're having another question. Uh, yes, uh, I have another question. So uh, I would have like two questions. So first question is that uh, in the radial velocity method, we saw that the value which we act actually find is like mass of planet multiplied by sine i. So it is more like uh, it will be quite lesser than the actual mass of the planet because it is multiplied by sine of some quantity. So is there a way to uh, make this prediction more accurate or is this the uh, value which we like take as the reference? And uh, second I... question would be, is there a way to uh, estimate the mass of the planet using the transit method? Because in the transit method, it uh, I only saw that we can only uh, see the size of the planet and not the mass itself. The transit method, yeah. So good, both are very interesting questions, Mohit. So the first one is MP sine I, okay? So uh, what we end up measuring, what we end up estimating from radial velocity method is MP sine I. Okay, we cannot determine MP. Inclination remains an unknown factor in radial velocity method. So let's say, uh, let's say that we determine, we use these equations and we finally find out MP sine I is equal to half the mass of Jupiter. So MP sine I is 0.5 times the mass of Jupiter. That's the mass of the exoplanet that you found. Now, if you write MP is equal to 0.5 times the mass of Jupiter, then that is a lower limit on the mass of the planet because you have assumed sine I to be one. If sine I is less than one, then the mass of the planet can be larger than 0.5 times the mass of Jupiter. So, um, uh, what radial velocity gives is not the absolute mass of the planet, but a lower limit on it. So how do you break this degeneracy or how do you how do you solve this problem? So once astronomers detect a planet using radial velocity method, they try to follow up that system using transit method. And transit method constrains the inclination of the orbit very well. If the orbital inclination is even slightly less than 90 degree, then the probability of seeing the transit will decline to zero. Okay, the duration of transit will be very, very small, even if the inclination is slightly less than 90 degree. In other words, if we will see the system and using transit method only if the orbital plane is along our line of sight. If the orbital plane is, uh, if the inclination is 88 degrees, not 90, then the transit probability or the duration of transit will dramatically come, come down and we will not be able to see it. So observing a radial velocity detected exoplanetary system through follow-up observations with transit method will provide us a constraint on the value of I. Okay, And that can be used to determine the absolute mass of the planet. Now, this is not always possible. There are more complexities to it. So I, I will stop my answer there and I'll come to your second question, which is radial well, uh, transit method. Exactly, as you rightly said, Mohit, through transit method, we can only measure the size of the planet. We cannot measure the mass. So what happens is radial velocity and transit method, both are attempted or both are, are used to measure the mass and radius of an exoplanet system. So mass comes from radial velocity, radius comes from transit method. And with that, you can also determine the density of this planet. From that, you can determine whether it is a rocky planet or whether it is a gas giant, because the density can come from mass and radius. So uh, it's they complement each other in that sense, these two techniques. One gives the mass and the other gives the size. Thank you, sir. Uh, and uh, I would have another question. Uh, so. Uh, so in uh, transit method, you said that we uh, see the change in the brightness in the star. So suppose that any given point of time, I point my telescope towards a particular star, either the planet would be in front of it or it would not be in front of it. So we would see a particular uh, value of brightness. So how would we uh, determine that it is good to observe this star for a longer period of time and we will find a transit there or something like that? Because uh, uh, it seems that uh, only by random chance we can uh, point the telescope exactly at the po time when the transit is about to occur. Yeah, very good. Excellent. So, uh, Mohit, again, an excellent question. So, the detecting an exoplanet using transit method involves some luck. Now, obviously, you cannot design an experiment based on luck. So, what, what is that the strategy that is adopted is 
instead of randomly looking at stars what astronomers do is they will observe a set of stars for a very long period of time so for example uh, let's say that tonight you decide to observe a star on some part of the sky and you don't see i mean you see that the brightness has a certain value and you say that okay this is there's no dip in brightness so why don't i observe some other star somewhere else tomorrow and then again you see that there's no dip in brightness so day after tomorrow you observe some other star that's a very inefficient strategy you will as you mentioned the transit duration is for a brief time so we should be observing that star when the transit is happening for us to detect it and the odds of that the chances of that is very very small so instead of hopping around from one star to another the strategy that astronomers adopt is they will continuously monitor a patch of the sky where there are hundreds of thousands of stars and in one go using wide angle ccd camera they will continuously monitor the brightnesses of all these stars and they'll keep on looking at the same set of stars again and again and again and again so instead of looking at random parts of the sky you focus your all your attention on that one patch of the sky where there are a large number of stars and using that you try to determine which of those have planets so the trade off is that you'll be your detections will be only confined to planets in that patch of the sky but the advantage is that you have beaten the odds you have beaten the probability of the random chance of observing a transit by keeping keep on looking at the same thing now this is the observational strategy of kepler space telescope what kepler space telescope did is it went up into this into, into space and the only instrument on kepler space telescope other than the telescope itself is a photometer which is basically a wide angle ccd camera and kepler was constantly looking at a patch of the sky in the direction of the constellation cygnus and lyra about 100 square degrees across and that part of the sky had about 150000 stars 150000 stars uh, which were reasonably bright enough for kepler to monitor its brightness and so it kept on staring at this 150000 stars throughout its mission lifetime and it only recorded the brightnesses of these 150000 stars and it discovered more than 2500 exoplanets around some of them so rather than looking at random regions this is what it did and kepler was on an earth trailing orbit which means that kepler was not orbiting around the earth it was actually parked in an orbit behind the earth and it was orbiting around the sun following the earth and so to keep the telescope pointed at this exact same patch of the sky you had to do some control systems okay so you had to do some orientation uh, repeatedly you have to reorient the telescope so that that same patch of the sky is always in the field of view of kepler so this was the observational strategy and the reason why kepler space telescope was finally wrapped up is because the control systems okay the the gyroscopes um on kepler failed uh, after some time and it could not be recovered so kepler lost its ability to keep looking at a certain patch of the sky and therefore the mission was officially decommissioned uh, sir i have a question so like yes, uh, many of the countries they have their uh, uh, like space agencies ob observatories all across the world like once uh, when you show that uh, one observatory of european union was there in chile so like mm -hmm. what is the basis of this like do they want to observe the sky from all of the points from the earth or like what is the basis of that like why do they do not build a space uh, observatory in their own country okay so uh, the location of ground based telescopes is based on the following factors one is you need to be uh, you need to position the ground based observatory at a location where from where the sky is clear okay so for example you know this i teach at the indian institute of space science and technology which is in tiruvananthapuram in kerala here 365 days if you take 365 days of a year for more than 150 days or 200 days we have cloudy skies and rain so this is a not a, the tropical regions are not a good place to put a telescope because the skies tend to be cloudy most of the time so you want to go to a place where you have a uh, clear skies for a good fraction of the year okay that's point number 1 point number 2 is you also want to go to a place where the sky is dry 
And what I mean by that is there's not much of water vapor present in the atmosphere. And the reason is because water vapor tends to absorb a lot of photons that reach us from outer space, particularly infrared photons. So if you have infrared detectors in your telescope, then its ideal location for positioning these telescopes is very arid or very dry uh, locations, Okay, very dry locations. So uh, Atacama Desert in Chile is a superb place for that. Uh, India also has a telescope at the Leh region of Ladakh. It's called the Himalayan Chandra Telescope, close to Mount Saraswati, which is in the Leh region of Ladakh, very close to the Chinese border. Uh, there is a observatory on top of, uh, you know, on a high altitude. There again, the, the, the sky is clear most of the year and the sky is also very dry. Okay, there's very little water vapor. So Himalayan Chandra Telescope can, is optimized to look at the universe at visible and infrared wavelengths. This is the second reason. Third is, the farther away you move from the equator, the smaller, uh, you, you will be having access to only a smaller portion of the sky. If you are living along the equator, during the course of one full year, the entire sky becomes accessible to us. If you are living far away from the equator, either north of the equator or south of the equator, let's say you are living far away from north of the equator, then only the northern celestial sphere will be accessible to us. The southern celestial sphere may not be accessible. Not all of it will be accessible. Similarly, if you are living ways below south of the equator, the southern celestial hemisphere will be fully visible, but not all of the northern hemisphere will be visible. So the ideal location is along the equator. But the problem with the equator is along the equator, you have tropical weather. So there's no point building a huge observatory in Kerala or Sri Lanka or places like that. So you need a dry conditions. You need mountain tops, summits where the sky conditions are clear. And you need to be, uh, you need to have access to the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere, which is why many of the countries in the northern hemisphere have observatories in Chile and in South Africa and places like that to access the southern sky also. Now, com coming to ground-based observatory versus space-based observatory, space-based op telescopes are very expensive. Okay, they are extremely costly. It takes a lot of money to uh, launch a space-based telescope, uh, whereas uh, with maybe one-tenth of the cost, you can build a much bigger ground-based observatory. So it's not uh, easy to keep launching space-based observatories, although there are many space-based observatories, primarily from NASA and ESA. Uh, and India also has AstroSat, okay, our own multi-wavelength observatory, astronomical observatory. So it's not uh, very easy to do this, both in terms of budget and in terms of uh, you know, finding enough justifications to do it. So this is the reason. So that doesn't mean that you only construct ground-based observatories. Both are attempted. For example, if you want to study the universe at ultraviolet wavelengths, or if you want to study the universe at X-ray wavelengths or gamma ray wavelengths, there's no option other than going to space. I won't say there's no option, but uh, you can do it much better by going to space. OK? So, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, thank you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, thank you, sir. Thank you for that uh, answer. And uh, we are running short of time, so we'll take the last question. So, that is in the chat. The question is in the chat. The question is, sir, apart from the revolutionary motion of star and the planet around each other, there are other motions present as well, like the revolution in a galaxy. How does these motions affect observation? And how are these effects negated in order to get more accurate results? Yeah. So uh, we, when we observe a star, we know which star we are observing. We know its coordinates. We know its position in the sky. We know where in the galaxy it is located. We also know when we are observing. We know on what date we are observing, what time exactly we are observing. So what date and what time we are observing will tell us where we are in our orbit around the sun. So if you are using a ground-based telescope, so telescope on Earth, we are going around the sun. So there is going to be a velocity component of Earth's orbit around the sun, which, is, which can also be directed towards the star. So this velocity is subtracted out. It is called heliocentric correction. This is subtracted out because we know exactly how Earth revolves around the sun. Second is we know which star we are observing so we know where we are, what is the 
line of sight of our observation. So based on that, we can estimate what is the component of the velocity that is directed towards or away from that star, which corresponds to the bulk motion, which corresponds to the revolution of the solar system with respect to the center of the galaxy and that star with respect to the center of the galaxy. So that value can also be subtracted out. Okay. Even if it is not subtracted out, what will happen is we will see that velocity superimposed on top of the radial velocity. So what I mean by that is suppose let's say that there is a net velocity of 50 meter per second that our Earth has relative to that star. Now, as we monitor the radial velocity of that star, we will find that the radial velocity varies as 50 meter per second, 55 meter per second, 50, 60 meter per second, then it will come down as 54, 52, then again it goes down as uh, 45, 40, then it again comes up as 48, 50, etc. So with respect to this 50 meter per second, we will see an oscillation. So that tells us that the center of mass of the system, the star planet system has a radial velocity, which is of the order of 50 meter per second. And that is the bulk motion radial velocity. The with respect to the, so with respect to the center of mass, you have to look at the fluctuation with, uh, with relative to that mean velocity. Okay, I don't know whether I'm making sense or not. So that's how these factors are taken into consideration. It's, uh, so there's a very careful analysis that goes in, okay. To do this. Yes, over to you, Nikita. Thank you, sir, for thank you, sir, for illuminating your knowledge on such an array of interesting topics. We thank all the participants for keeping the session lively and asking relevant questions for better interaction and better grasp of the knowledge which sir just presented. We thank you all for being a part of the first episode of Tech Vistara. We'll be coming up with many episodes in line. Till then, see you soon. Keep healthy and happy. Bye-bye.